This topic, alternatives to opioids for the treatment of acute pain, is actually the uh, topic that came up the most on the uh, recent deliverables that are round one sites that began in March of 2019 completed. So this uh, topic just came up again and again and again. We did do a Q&A with Andrew Herring at our November training that was in Sacramento, and that room um, overflowed. So it's a topic of um, high interest for the sites, high impact in treating patients, and I'm really excited that we're able to have um, doctors Alicia Kurtz and Sky Lee from our California Bridge Regional Director team. They are both currently based in Sacramento, though um, that will be shifting in a couple of weeks. Alicia is um, heading to Southern California, although she will still be involved with us. Um, all right, so a couple quick tech things. We have Caroline, who is our um, Superstar California Bridge Program Coordinator on the call, and she is here to make sure that everything goes smoothly for us. So if you're having any issues with the Zoom, you can send a chat to Caroline specifically. If you go to the chat function, instead of to all panelists, it can go to Caroline directly. And um, if you want to ask a question, you can actually do it two ways. You can send it to the chat, which Robert has just shown us a great example of, and I'm gonna make sure to read that out before we get started or you can use the raise hand function. So raise hand might be good if you want um, to have more of a conversation with Alicia and Sky. So, um, and just as a fair warning, if you do use the chat function, we might um, unmute you and wanna hear from you anyway. So a um, couple ways to get in touch with us, and I think it's about time to dive in. So uh, Alicia and Sky, I just want to, um, draw your attention to this question from Robert, make sure we're gonna get there. He says, I have two occasions where a patient comes into the ER with a history of methadone and, the, and they're for hip, and he's um, presenting for hip surgery. How do we hit the sweet spot between pain remediation to stop the pain meds and, start, and to start withdrawal to start Suboxone? That I is, make sure. the, yeah, that's the perfect question for why we're even giving this lecture in the first place. Yeah, and so I think the actual technical answer to Robert's question will come from Sky later in the lecture. So stay tuned, Robert. Don't hang up early, <laughs> um, or you're gonna miss it. Uh, but that's awesome. That's like, that's actually like the exact type of scenario that has driven us to want to talk about this. Both because we want to be able to have other options when opioids are really not needed. Like there was there was a time where we gave Norco to everyone for everything, and we don't want to do that anymore. So that's why it's important to know the alternatives, but also for people who are on chronic opioid medication like, like buprenorphine or methadone, we need to be able to treat their pain in other ways because those opioid receptors are already being used. And so throwing, you know, sometimes there's space for more uh, morphine or Dilaudid, et cetera, but sometimes there's really not. All right. Alicia, I just yeah. want to throw in one more tech thing, which is that um, Alicia and Sky are not going to have very many pauses for questions, but they're still taking questions. So if you have questions as they're going through, um, put them in the chat or raise their hand and Caroline and I will make sure those get answered as we go. Um, so take it away. Awesome. So first, this is just a map of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, basically covering what is ALTO, this idea of alternative to opioids. We'll talk about pain management for patients who are on buprenorphine, um, specifically a little bit about patient education and setting expectations, which is a very important component of this whole program. And then finally, some um, prescribing guidelines for providers about opioids. So for those of you who are on this call who are not um, a provider, hopefully this will be a good exposure to you and you can kind of help try to push your clinician champion, your physician or your AP champion um, to do this kind of education with their group. And if you're a provider on the call, hopefully this provides you with some information that you haven't heard before. And so first things first, let's talk about what is ALTO, um, why do we need this, and then how do we do it? So this is a graph that if you are in the bridge program, you've definitely seen before that shows the significant rise in opioid related deaths uh, over the past handful of years. It's not new news. But what I wanna point out on this slide specifically is that 36% of these deaths involve prescription opioids, prescription opioids. So that's about 50 people a day in the U.S. who are dying from a prescribed medication that they overdose on, whether it's intentionally or not. 
So that's a third. A third of the opioid deaths are because of us misprescribing or prescribing without education, opioid medication. And that's why I think we have to take responsibility and do something about this because that third of death is directly on us um, to intervene and to do a better job. So when we look at the Department of Health and Human Services overall plan for addressing opioid, uh, opioid harm and, and reducing that in our communities, there are three main pillars. One is prevention. These two we're really good at in the bridge program so far. Recovery, which we know, starting patients on buprenorphine or methadone, using medication for addiction treatment. Um, and then also this idea of harm reduction. We've had great uh, lectures in our trainings from the Harm Reduction Coalition about using language, changing culture, um, you know, things like clean syringe and needle, clean injection practices, all that kind of stuff. So we've done a lot of work in these two areas as a program so far, but what you all asked us for, as Elizabeth said, is that you wanted this, this other education, this how do I use other medicines that aren't opioids to prevent exposing someone who doesn't need them or to be able to treat pain in somebody who's already on them. So Alto's alternative to opioids main principle is that if you use alternatives to opioids and you're successful with pain management that way, then in a lot of cases, especially in the ER, you never expose somebody to opioids to begin with, which prevents um, what we know, which is that about 6% of people, so six out of 100, um, after only five days of being on an opioid prescribed medication, will go into long-term use. That's not, I mean, it seems like a small number, but it's kind of a lot. If you think about how many prescriptions for Norco or Oxy or Percocet, whatever, that we're writing, 6% is a lot, five days only. So you break your ankle, you go home with five to seven days of Norco, and all of a sudden you go into long-term use. So it's this idea that we, that, that again, that group is our responsibility. Um, we also really do need to be better at treating pain with things that are not opioids, because that's our, our reflexive response, and it shouldn't be. So when we think about how many visits come to the ER every year, we know that most of them, a lot of them are for pain. 42% are pain related. And right now, 17% of those patients receive opioids while they're in the emergency department. And I think for those of us who work clinically, you know that probably the majority of those patients don't actually need an opioid. It's one thing when you're like trauma or you know, big open fracture or your appendix is bursting, but the ankle sprains and um, abscesses, which we can talk in detail about, uh, those kinds of things, chest, atypical chest pain, um, all kinds of headaches, really don't need opioids. And so while historically it feels like someone says, hey, I have pain, and we throw opioids at them and then do other things, we want to change that narrative to someone comes in with pain, I've got a ton of stuff up my sleeve I'm going to try, and then if that doesn't work, I can use opioids for breakthrough. And that leads us to this alternative to opioids program, which the goal is to use non-opioid medications as first line with opioids still there as second line or first line in really severe episodes of pain. It also really importantly, again, involves the discussing realistic pain management goals with your patient and also openly talking about the potential for addiction and side effects or harm or accidental overdose with patients. Um, because us normalizing that conversation will actually help to save lives. One of the ways that Alto works uh, is by looking at the fact that we have pain in our bodies from way, way more mechanisms than just that mu receptor where the opioids work. So the opioid receptor is one of them, but we have lots of others. And so we're, you know, throwing opioids at the one, we need to look at the COX uh, system, the NMDA receptor, sodium channels, GABA. There's all different kinds of ways that humans experience pain. And so that's why this is going to include some of the medications on the slide and others too. It's a, there's a lot of other ways we can treat pain. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that this program started at St. Joseph's in New Jersey. Uh, it was created by two, two physicians, Dr. Mark Rosenberg and Dr. Alexis LaPietra. Um, and I literally, everything I'm about to teach you, I learned from them uh, or doing my own research, but I should just give a quick thank you to them. They were the principal investigators in rolling out an ALTO program in their hospital. And what they saw was that after two years, they were able to decrease their opioid prescription rates um, this does not include Suboxone or Buprenorphine, but for their like Norco, Oxy, Percocet, those things, by 80% in two years, 80% fewer. And their overall opioid reduction rate in the ER, so while patients were there, was more than a third. I should mention that during the same time period, their patient satisfaction scores went up 
So it wasn't that they weren't doing a good job or that everyone just hates them. They just found ways that educating their staff, they could do a really good job without opioids. So there are five main areas of treatment, um, plus some ideas about procedure pain control in the ER, and we're gonna run through each of them briefly here. The first one is, I think, a pretty typical patient that many of us have seen. You've got maybe a, a youngish 40-something-year-old male who comes in, he's got some flank pain, he says, hey, I, I have a history of kidney stones, this feels the same, he's kind of writhing around, he's nauseous, he clearly doesn't feel very well, he's obviously in pain, and it sounds to you like pretty classic renal colic. We all know that kidney stones are extremely painful, <laughs> nobody would doubt that. But what we don't realize is that you don't need opioids to do a good job controlling pain and renal colic. So the first line therapy for somebody who has kidney stone pain should be acetaminophen one gram, so a thousand milligrams, plus an NSAID like Ketorolac, which is Toradol. And by the way, if I use brand names, it's just that a habit. I promise that no pharmaceutical companies are paying me to say their brand name. It's just like when we say Suboxone, we've got nothing against, you know, Stubby Tech or the other ones, just what we're used to saying. Um, but Toradol, 15 milligrams IV, and then some fluids. So I should note that studies have proven over and over again in a lot of situations that Tylenol plus an NSAID works better than either of those medications alone. So if you're ever going to give somebody acetaminophen and you're not concerned about pregnancy, throw in, or, or chronic renal issues, you know, don't be afraid to throw in that NSAID. And then also you'll notice that the dose on here says 15 milligrams of Ketorolac IV. Um, studies have proven efficacy at 10 or 15. You do not need 30 milligrams or 60 milligrams IV. That's way too much. And so if you give the lower doses, 10 to 15 milligrams intravenous, um, it has a lower risk of acute kidney injury and GI bleeds. So we can easily go with the lower doses. If you're doing intramuscular, usually people are still using the 30, but you don't need 60. So try to embed those new doses in your brain if you're not already. 10 to 15 IV Ketorolac or 30 milligrams IM. Tylenol, oral versus IV, have been compared many times, and they work the same. So even though people psychologically sometimes want the IV medication, don't hesitate to give oral Tylenol. It is pennies on the dollar, both for the hospital system and for the patient. And so that's one of those things where if the IV is not better, why would you give the IV if it's going to cost them less? If that doesn't work though, another, your kind of second line treatment is actually to use lidocaine. So we first studied lidocaine for pain and not just localized anesthesia, but for systemic pain uh, in, in the oncology world. And in 2004, they studied lidocaine infusions in their cancer patients and had great success. So then in the post-operative world, uh, more into the late 2000s with a, a big Cochrane review in 2015, they looked at ONC and post-operative literature and showed that there was immediate reduced pain that lasts up to 24 hours, plus overall less opioid use, um, quicker return to bowel movements, the, uh, decreased length of stay, all the things we care about a lot in the, in the post-operative setting. Um, along with less nausea and vomiting, and no difference at all in rates of death or arrhythmia or toxicity or other heart disease things that we would worry about as a side effect of lidocaine. So it was extremely safe, very effective, um, and the conclusion with, was that there was moderate to good evidence that IV lidocaine has an impact both on the pain score compared to placebo, um, as well as being very safe and efficacious. We first thought about this with renal colic because in Iran, they actually don't have NSAIDs. They only have, or IV NSAIDs, they only have IM. And so they were looking for alternatives to help people feel better. And when they saw this literature about uh, the oncology world and the post-operative world, they started using it for renal colic. And that's where we first found in a, a pretty large randomized control trial that 0 0.1 milligrams per kilogram of IV morphine, which is a lot, it's a standard dosing technically, but you're talking like six to eight milligrams of morphine IV compared to 1.5 mg per kilo IV of lidocaine, um, the patients on lidocaine did better than they did with the morphine. They felt better. It was better on their pain skill. And then again, there was no difference in adverse events. For those of you concerned about lidocaine toxicity, remember that toxic doses of lidocaine are five milligrams per kilogram. So 1.5 mg per kilo is a very safe dose that maxes out at about 200. Um, and that's run usually in a piggyback over about a half an hour. Uh, a lot of facilities will mandate that you put it on a monitor, but again, the science does not show any increase in arrhythmias um, or cardiac-related adverse events. 
So that's the recommendation. Lido, 1.5 milligrams per kilogram to a maximum of 200 milligrams. Uh, you need about 30 minute OBS on a monitor is what most hospitals are gonna ask you to do. And you give it with the NSAID and the Tylenol. So don't forget those two. The only contraindications here, obviously if you're allergic to lidocaine, don't give people lidocaine. If they do have a seizure history, because lidocaine lowers the seizure thresholds, and then if they have known cardiac disease. So people who have, say, structural heart disease or valve disease, arrhythmias like AFib or a really severe coronary artery disease. And while the literature does not support that there was any issue with adverse events, it's more just one of those, you don't want to poke the bear. Like we know that that heart is structurally a little bit weaker, um, and so we don't want to want to mess with that. I'm not going to spend this much time going through every medication, but I am on medicines like IV lidocaine, where I think people are less familiar. So I'll pause here very briefly. Are there any questions specifically about lidocaine or the renal colic? I see some questions, but not about that. Okay. If there are any, don't, fee, don't be afraid to pop them into the chat at any time. So first line, Tylenol plus NSAID with the fluid bolus. And then second line treatment, lidocaine 1.5 mix per kilo, um, run over 15, 10 or 15 minutes out of pump or in a piggyback. Okay, piggyback is easier for your nurses. So <laughs> there's that. All right, patient number two. Um, you've got a maybe 40s to 50s year old individual. They're otherwise pretty healthy. They were outside, you know, working in their yard, bending over a lot. Um, uh, doing planting and building a garden, which everyone is doing these days with stay at home <laughs> and trying to find things to do. And they're just coming in with really severe low back pain. They don't have any crazy red flags. You're not thinking infection, et cetera. But um, it's pretty bad. They're having trouble walking and they're just in a lot of pain. So muscles specifically, we know, and backs need movement to heal. And if you just think about opioids in general, they don't really support being active and moving. They make people sleepy and want to lay on the couch. In addition, musculoskeletal issues like back pain are an inflammatory process. And so we have to address it as an inflammatory process and educate our patients that this is going to take some time to heal. They're probably going to feel worse in the mornings because they were asleep and laying and getting stiff all night. Um, but what they need is time to get a warm shower and massage and stretch and take the medicines we're going to talk about and not something like Norco to make it instantly go away. So first line for any musculoskeletal pain is going to be that same combo, one gram of, of Tylenol or acetaminophen plus an NSAID like ibuprofen. Ibuprofen, quick note about it, 400 milligrams oral, so that's two over-the-counter tablets of ibuprofen, is the analgesic ceiling, which means higher doses, 600, 800 milligrams of ibuprofen, don't actually treat pain any better than just 400 milligrams. There is some anti-inflammatory benefit, uh, more anti-inflammatory benefit at the 600 and 800 milligram level, but there's also an increased risk of GI bleed and kidney injury. So for most people uh, in the ER, I'll give them a single dose of 600 milligrams ibuprofen that time, but when they go home, I recommend 400 milligrams every six hours. It's easier on their tummy, um, it has less side effects like I mentioned, and it's not gonna um, treat their pain any better to take those higher doses. So one gram of Tylenol plus maybe 400 to 600 um, milligrams of ibuprofen is gonna be your first, your first bet. Then, as a side note on this one, uh, about naproxen. So a lot of times people will want um, to use naproxen because it's easier to dose than ibuprofen to twice a day instead of an every six hour. Studies have shown they're equivocal, so I would recommend using whichever one you want, that's fine. Um, but as proof of why this is good, there are several studies from JAMA, which is a great journal of American Medical Association, one of the more respected ones. And they looked at naproxen versus naproxen plus oxycodone. And adding oxycodone did not add any pain relief benefit. They also looked at naproxen plus diazepam or Valium. Um, and the benzo didn't help or add anything either in people's pain control. So it turns out that the NSAID alone was equally as effective as trying to add a, benzo di um, a benzodiazepine or an opiate. So you want to stick with just the, the Tylenol and the naproxen or Tylenol and ibuprofen. Um, okay, next thing. Feel free. I keep looking to see if there's any questions. I don't see any, but don't feel like you have to wait till the end. Um, so that said, you've given your anti-inflammatory initial medications. A lot of times people will add a muscle relaxer. And the evidence does not actually support doing this, uh, especially long-term, because 
they don't actually relax muscles. <laughs> the mechanism that they work is by making people sleepier. And so they quote, relax because they're tired and not because uh, their muscles are physically relaxing. There's no physical relaxing of muscles that happens um, from these medications. Instead, they just relax the patient. It's not a muscle relaxer, it's a patient relaxer. And in some cases, getting some sleep and some rest, if you've been up all night with back pain, can be helpful in and of itself. And so if you're gonna use, um, a quote, muscle relaxer or a patient relaxer like a cyclobenzaprine, Flexeril, um, or Valium, realize that what you're doing is you're trying to help the patient relax and be calm and get some rest and not relax their muscles. So a one-time dose in the ER might be helpful, but you should not be sending people home with a prescription for this medicine for musculoskeletal or back pain. Not at all. They're addictive, they have bad side effects, especially when combined with opioids. There's a risk of respiratory depression, um, to stop breathing and all that kind of stuff. So avoid it. But the, some, some patients, like the one-time dose in the ER can be very helpful. Uh, Flexeril five milligrams versus 10 milligrams, for those of you who aren't sure which one to use, are equally as effective. 10 is more sedating. So generally speaking, um, it's better to use the five milligrams of Flexeril. Let me just check this question. Oh, it's Sky. Sky's chiming in. So if you're not following the chat, make sure you're following the chat. If the patient has neuropathic sounding pain, burning, tingling in the legs, um, or that like shooting pain, and they're describing almost like a sciatica type picture, uh, there is evidence that shows that giving a single dose of 300 to 600 milligrams of gabapentin once in the ED can help with that. It should be noted to keep adding to the, the lessons here that opioids are known to aggravate nerve pain, nervous pain. Um, and so we need to make sure that we're using the right medication and not just covering it up and making it worse in the end. So starting with gabapentin, a one-time dose in the ER is safe um, for people who are having more acute on chronic pain. They have a lot of issues and they're gonna go on it long-term. Realize that you have to titrate gabapentin up. Um, so usually starting gabapentin 300 milligrams at night for about three or four days and then it can increase is typical, but that should really be done inpatient where we are, are able to do that for them or by a primary doctor. And it's not, I wouldn't recommend sending home a prescription from the emergency department, but that single, that single dose is really helpful. All right. Also, so we've talked about oral medications. Don't forget the skin. So things like heat and cold really do work for people. Neither has ever been proven to be better. I think it's very patient specific. Some people like to ice it. Some people like hot pads, whatever. If they like it and it helps them, they can do it. It's very safe. But don't forget to attack your muscles at the skin level. And so here there are a couple of options. One of them is lidocaine patches. There are over-the-counter 3.6 or 4% versions. There's also a prescription 5% version. Um, the over-the-counter one is really cheap. It's like two to four dollars per patch, which is a good option if people don't have insurance. However, I know a lot of people who anecdotally have used them who say that the 5% prescription one sticks better. It just physically is a much better patch. Um, but again, if finances are a barrier or someone doesn't have insurance coverage, recommending the over-the-counter one is totally okay. We also have things like a diclofenac gel or diclofenac ointment, which is in topical NSAID. And the reason this is a great option is if you've got those renal patients or people who have a GI bleed who cannot take, or a, a bypass, a gastric bypass surgery, and they can't have oral NSAIDs, topical NSAIDs are a very good second option because they work similarly. They'll help with the anti-inflammatory process, but they're not going to aggravate those other contraindications for being on NSAIDs. Um, and then they also have shown that the, the lidocaine patches are better compared to placebo for helping with back pain. So there's a lot of evidence in all the things that we're going over. We will talk about ketamine in detail in a few minutes, but I'm going to just throw out there that if all those things don't work, you always have ketamine as another option. And again, we'll come back to that. And then finally, this is my favorite thing in acute back pain, trigger point injections. So these are very commonly, commonly used in pain management clinics or, or PM&R type uh, clinics. And in some places, physical therapists can even do this. And if you're not doing this as a provider in the ER, I really hope that you'll watch some videos and learn it and start using it. It's one of my literally like highest satisfaction rate things that I love to do at triage. It's so fast and it's really easy. And the concept is that in our back and our neck, uh, we have very, very strong muscles and they form these knots, which I'm sure you're familiar with from like when you're rubbing your own back and you're like, oh, like there's that spot and you kind of hit it and just big nasty ball. 
And you'll know you're on the patient's trigger point because as you're moving your thumb over it, you'll hit it and they go, ah. So it's the moment when they kind of pull away from you and they say, oh yeah, that's aggravating. And it might be low down, it might be up higher in their trapezius area, up in the neck. Um, but if you can find one of those spots that you hit it, what you're talking about is an area where those muscle fibers have bonded super, super tightly together. And think about it kind of like an abscess. So in an abscess, there's no blood flow. So we can't give oral antibiotics to get into the abscess. Instead, we got to cut it open and get that pus out. A, a muscle um, that has become a huge knot or a trigger point is similar. Those bonds are really, really tight. There's no good blood flow in that area. And so all the oral medications that you're using aren't going to get all the way into that and penetrate that that not to relax it. So instead it needs a physical disruption, a physical breaking up of those bonds. Super simple procedure. You literally just take an alcohol swab, you clean it up, you take your fingers and you kind of hover over the area where you feel that muscle knot. So you find it, you put your fingers around it, you've cleaned it already. You're gonna take some lidocaine and the lidocaine specifically is to numb the skin. Uh, it's not actually part of the trigger point, but it's called an injection because of the lidocaine but the trigger point breakup part is just called dry needling, but everyone calls it a trigger point injection. So it's the injection part that makes us a little bit more special in healthcare, in medicine, rather than like a physical therapist. Um, and so you give that lidocaine, then you're gonna take a needle, a small needle, a 27, 25, I wouldn't go bigger than a 23, um, and that's maybe an, you know, an inch long if you're talking about lower back, but you must use a smaller one if you're gonna be up higher in the spine just because you've got more critical structures. So you take a small needle and you're just gonna insert it directly into that spot, pull most of the way out, re-angle, and then go in again, pull out, re-angle, go in again, pull almost all the way out, re-angle. And you're just kind of trying to break up all the spots of that, of that trigger uh, muscle knot so that you're really d disrupting all those physical bonds. Um, you will know you did it perfectly if the, if it kind of goes like this whoop, and it has this like electrical shock. It's actually pathognomonic for hitting the trigger point. If it doesn't do that, don't panic. It's okay. Um, and then as you're pulling out that needle, you should inject a little bit of lidocaine in your track. And that's just to help with um, soreness from your actual needle. It's again, not treating the muscle uh, trigger point. It's treating that you were poking them with a needle. But so that's how you do that. So you go in straight. You re-angle, you point the other way, you just kind of get to all those spots, pull it out, put a Band-Aid on, and move on with your day. And if you do it right, within two or three minutes, I kid you not, the person will hug you. Maybe not in the time of COVID, but usually they do. I actually have gotten more hugs to mature point than I can tell you. Someone like laid up on a bed, cannot move. You do this to their one muscle knot, two minutes later they stand up. I had a 60 something year old guy where I, I gave him zero medications. I did this and he got off the bed, started crying, lifted his wife out of the chair and started dancing with her. He was so excited. So really simple procedure. There are lots of videos about it online. I see some questions popping up here. Yeah, I want, hey, this is Elizabeth. Uh, there's a couple questions coming in. There was a question from the Q&A box, short course steroids for herniated discs, sciatica related pain. I've read no in the literature, but occasionally seen this practice. And Sky answered that with a couple different things. So Sky, I'm wondering if you want to chime in and just summarize what you shared in the chat. Yeah, um, I tend not to use a short course of steroids for sciatica and herniated disc. I do basically what Alicia is talking about. I max out the ibuprofen, the acetaminophen. I do a lot of physical therapy, gabapentin, particularly for sciatica. I don't do the steroid course because a lot of my patients have some side effects from it. And if this becomes something chronic, this is something that um, they will keep expecting to ask me about is to do, keep doing more and more steroid courses. And so I find that other modalities are a little bit better. And I also have a low threshold for trigger point injections. And I just put in a paper about paraspinous lidocaine injections to help with um, chronic nonspecific back pain. Awesome. And I, what I will actually say to support what Sky is saying is that the evidence is not there for steroids. They have done studies with somebody on a Medrol dose pack uh, so solumeterol for five days, which is the easiest thing that people will order, that compared to placebo, and they did not do better with the steroids. And so we know steroids have adrenal suppression, they cause um, glucose to be more out of control, and so many of our patients have diabetes, so if there's no benefit, we, we probably shouldn't be using that. Tommy asked about rubbing it out. Yeah, absolutely. So another reason that I love topical medicines like lidocaine creams or diclofenac gel uh, is that to put it on, the person has to rub it. <laughs> and so that's one of my favorite one of my favorite things to do about that. 
I'm just checking it again. Okay, cool. Awesome. So again, first line, Tylenol ibuprofen uh, or some kind of an NSAID, maybe a one-time patient relaxer in the emergency department. If neuropathic pain, add that gabapentin 300 to 600 milligram one-time dose in the ER. I would leave it to the internal medicine team in the hospital or a primary provider um, to titrate up if that's going to be a chronic med for the patient, but we can use it safely once in the ER. Lidocaine patch or diclofenac gel, some topical treatments, hot colds, rubbing it. Um, we'll talk about ketamine later and then trigger points also. If you do do a trigger point, just don't forget that you should also continue to do the rest of this. So if the patient feels better, that's great, but you should still send them with info about taking Tylenol, ibuprofen, and some topical agents when they get home, because while that knot's disrupted, they're still going to have soreness for a couple of days. So let's say that you do all of this and the patient is still just in a ton of pain, or alternatively, you're talking about a person who already takes opioids. Maybe somebody has chronic back pain and they're on Norco from their primary provider and they're like, my Norco's not working. I doubled up the doses at home and I just feel awful. I can barely walk. What do we normally do in this case? We say, you know what? This person's already on Norco or they're already on Percocet. So grab the opioids. Like this is not the case that we're going to do it. And the answer is actually no. That's, that's the opposite of what we should do. This person just told you I doubled up on my opioid dosing. I'm fully saturating my opioid receptor, my mu receptor, and it's not working. That receptor is already occupied. So throwing morphine or Dilaudid um, or fentanyl at a patient like this is just trying to do more of what's not working. And eventually that circulating amount, since their receptors are full, is just gonna cause them to get sleepier and maybe they'll feel better because they're tired or feeling a little bit high, but it's not actually going to treat uh, their pain any better. So realistically, the best thing to do is to go back to what we talked about before, which is to use these other modalities. And what happens then? The patient always says to you, those things don't work for me. I tried talent on the past, doesn't work for me. I tried ibuprofen, doesn't work for me. And what you have to remember to tell them is like, listen, this is not your normal back pain. We are talking about an acute flare, an acute inflammation of your chronic pain. And so we are gonna treat it with acute inflammatory type medications. Um, and so this is what we're gonna use. And then you go through it and you try it with them. Um, those patients I usually end up doing, I usually will end up doing one of the patient relaxer medicines, like a Valium one time in the ER, because I do find that with chronic pain, especially there's a lot of stress and anxiety um, that naturally come with having chronic pain. And so I tend to lean on those a little bit more heavily, again, as a single time dose in the ER, not for prescription for home. But then moving on from there, we do have some other options, one of them being ketamine. And when we talk about ketamine in this state setting, what we mean is ketamine as the analgesic, which oftentimes we say subdissociated ketamine, because we know that we use ketamine for um, sedation, and that's not what we're talking about here. So less than dissociative, subdissociative or analgesic dosing. And the reason this is a great medicine is that ketamine works on the NMDA receptor, which is wide open for our patients, even if they're already on opioids, because not being touched, just sitting there waiting for somebody to help take care of it. And ketamine is an antagonist. It shuts down the NMDA receptor, which helps wind down our neural excitation processes, which can be associated with pain. And so, you know, again, throwing on tramadol or fentanyl, et cetera, isn't going to do it, but this receptor is wide open for us. At the sedation dose that we're used to, Everyone knows, well, most providers would know that you're going to use two milligrams per kilogram IV or four milligrams per kilogram IM. That's our sedation, intubation, or maybe we're doing like a fixing a fracture in the ER. That's the dosing we're using for that. In this case, for pain, when we talk about subdissociative ketamine, it's 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 milligrams per kilogram IV. Um, that is really, really important to burn in your brain, but that's the right dosing because if you go higher than that, but less than two mg per kilo, that's what we call the K-hole. That's like the, um, the recreational zone of using ketamine. And that's definitely not what we're trying to do. We're not trying to use it as a recreational drug or make people kind of agitated and, and sort of acutely psychotic. We're trying to use the much smaller doses, 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 mg per kilo IV compared to the higher sedation doses and staying away from that, that middle zone. 
me just pop in um, or any of these questions about ketamine. Hey, this is uh, Elizabeth. I'm not about ketamine, but um, Phil, <laughs> Philip Ross asked, can we get the slides and video of this session? It would be so helpful for um, RX Safe Del Norte Coalition. Yes and yes. And also I'll put in a plug um, that Alicia and Sky, as members of the California Bridge Regional Director team are actually available to present at your coalition or to get on the phone with you and troubleshoot any questions you might still have after this presentation. So yes, we will send out the slides. We will send out the video, potentially not immediately, but um, it will be available soon. And then please consider Alicia and Sky as ongoing resources, not uh, Zoom box heads that then vanish. Um, <laughs> We're continue. real. They're real. They're real. Yeah. Yeah. They're definitely real. Trust me. All right. Carry on. This is great. Thank you. No problem. So the way that we usually give ketamine is going to be that 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 mix per kilo put into 50 cc's of NS. So piggyback given over 10 minutes. Um, you can also give it intramuscularly. That dosing is 0 0.3 mix per kilogram. You can also use it intranasally, and that's going to be 0 0.5 milligrams per kilogram, and it maxes at 50, 50 milligrams. And the way you do that with any intranasal medicine, right, you put it into the, a little syringe. You want to use the very concentrated version and not be putting a ton of fluid in people's noses. But on the end, there's this little triangular atomizer. You do half in one nair, half in the other nair, shoot it straight back. It takes about 10 or 15 minutes to kick in. And ketamine lives in your system for about 30 to 45 minutes at this dosing. So you can repeat the dose after about 45 minutes if the patient felt better and got worse or you want to try it again. And then if that say that, that works, maybe the patient um, continues to have breakthrough pain after they do well for a while, the ketamine wears off, it gets worse, and maybe they're getting admitted. This one would take a little bit more um, uh, work with your pharmacy and nursing teams for education so that everyone's comfortable. But a safe option is you can start a ketamine drip at 0 0.1 mg per kilo every hour um, until their pain is tolerable. And so again, the inpatient floors are not always comfortable with this, but usually you can get something past a, a nursing protocol passed through your ER that makes everybody more comfortable. So you can at least use it while the patient's in the emergency department. Um, and sometimes once you've broken that crisis of their acute pain flare with these other things, maybe a couple of doses of ketamine, the, a dose of the, the Flexeril, your anti-inflammatory medicines, and hours gone by, they took a nap, and now you're avoiding an admission for intractable back pain, and you never gave opioids, um, which is really helpful. So consider all of those options as well. People ask you about the side effects. They're like, this is a recreational drug, and you know, people go psychotic on it. What do you see when you give it at these lower doses? And the answer is not a lot. Um, some people report an altered sensorium. They describe it as like an out of body kind of experience or feeling a little bit off, but they're fully coherent and oriented and talking to you. They're not dissociated like they are when we give the sedation level doses. Um, and there's no emergence phenomenon, which is sometimes people have a bad effect coming out of a ketamine sedation that's not ever seen at these lower doses. Um, according to all the literature, you do not need a monitor to be giving patients doses of ketamine. So ideally, once you've done education with your department, you could give an intranasal dose. The person can go wait in the lobby um, until you have a bed available um, or whatever. It's kind of like how we always talk about with buprenorphine. When people are less comfortable with something, they always want to throw monitors at it, but it's not actually indicated. Um, all of the anesthesia and emergency literature that surrounds ketamine are supportive of that it's safe and not using a, a monitor as long as the dosing was appropriate. So the take home is that ketamine is a great tool to have in your toolbox um, for these more difficult to treat patients and it is very safe and effective. We just talked about steroids. Um, a single dose of dexamethasone has been shown in refractory headaches as well as in uh, acute on chronic back pain to sometimes help with the analgesic effects of dexamethasone. So we're talking about dex specifically, not prednisone or cyumeterol or others. Dexamethasone actually has um, decadron has a component that treats pain. And so when you're giving it, you're actually using it as a one-time dose in the ER pain medicine and not as a steroid. So I just wanna emphasize that again, the literature on steroids does not su uh, support going home with a steroid dose pack. Um, and then again, I don't advise sending people home with a benzodiazepine or a muscle relaxer, patient relaxer prescription, but sometimes those one-time doses can really help with those psychosomatic uh, components of chronic pain. This is the overall picture. If you're gonna take a picture of something, this is the one. Start with anti-inflammatories and muscle or patient relaxers. 
treat neuropathic pain. Don't forget to do topical stuff. Use ketamine if you really need it also. Um, and then you can also use dexamethasone as a pain medicine. I'll pause here for one second. That, that one had a lot of material in it. I don't see anything new popping up. Okay, awesome. Next patients. Let's say you've got, you know, a, another 50 something year old female. She has this bad belly pain. She's had a hysterectomy, so it's definitely not a baby. Um, and she just feels terrible and she has belly pain every day for forever. Maybe she has um, in, irritable bowel syndrome or no one's ever been really able to give her a formal diagnosis, but she has this terrible belly pain and it's been worse for the past couple of days. She can't keep anything down and she just looks uncomfortable. For those of you who work in an ER, you know that you see this patient at least once a shift, every single shift. Um, and this is again, one of the, the times where when we treat it, opioids is bad, right? Number one, if we keep giving people with chronic pain opioids, it builds tolerance. They work less well for them, requires higher doses, and then they start to struggle with the side effects, which is ultimately not great. It also slows down the gut and causes constipation, which if you have chronic belly pain, that's not helping you. Um, and so we have a lot more work to do in these types of patients. And the very first thing that we have to do is set really clear expectations. This is true for our chronic back pain patients, chronic belly pain, chronic anything pain patients. While chronic pain is terrible and it is distressing, it is not at all realistic to expect to feel pain-free coming to the ER, either that day in the ER or in the hospital or when they go home um, on their medicines at home. And so I think one of our challenges as a community is that we need to get way better at talking about this with people and talking about it openly and talking about the phrase break crisis, right? You have chronic pain. I'm not going to be able to take your pain all the way away today as much as I would like to. Instead, our goal together is to break crisis from your pain and bring it to a toler tolerable level so that you can eat and walk around your house and go to the store or get in the car and drive um, without being in such severe pain. So our goal is to break crisis. It's not to become pain-free. It's to get to a functional level. And then once you've done that, um, you know, this first recommendation is going to be very similar uh, to what we've been talking about before. You're going to want to give your NSAIDs and your Tylenol if the person's not taking it already, especially for other kinds of chronic pain, maybe musculoskeletal pain. Um, and again, you can give the oral or if somebody's not tolerating oral, that would be a good opportunity for the Ofermed or the IV Tylenol. We talked about the dosing on Motrin, so 400 to 600 milligrams once in the ER, they can go home with 400 at home, or the Ketorolac Toradol, 30 milligrams IM, or 10 to 15 milligrams IV. If they have neuropathic sounding pain, throw on that gabapentin one time, 300 to 600 milligram dose, um, and then ask them to talk about that with their doctor, if it worked for them. Other considerations specifically about belly pain. We have a lot of different medicines that do different things. So metoclopramide, which is Reglan, um, is a prokinetic agent. It's thought to help stimulate the peristalsis, the movements of the gut, which is really good for like diabetics, who we know tend to have slower emptying, especially when their blood sugars are really high. So gastroparesis patients, um, chronic diabetes patients, oftentimes they are helped by getting a prokinetic agent like Reglan to help their gut move more normally. Um, compare that on the opposite end to dicyclamine, which is often just called Bentil, the most common brand. Um, Bentil is an irritable bowel medication. So usually people with irritable bowel syndrome have a lot of cramping, they have diarrhea, they have too much going on in their tummy and they want it to be slowed down. And so Bentil does that, it slows down that cramping by, by slowing the natural movements of the gut, that peristalsis, and it relaxes the muscle, the smooth muscles in the stomach and in the intestines. Prochlorper long words, compazine. <laughs> Prochlorperazine is, is compazine. Um, compazine is a nausea vomiting medication. It's great. But if you remember, uh, it's also sometimes used for anxiety. It's, a, it's an anti-anxiety medication. And we know with chronic pain, a lot of times there's depression and anxiety type emotions that go around it. And so compazine specifically can be an awesome medication for treating those non-nociceptive, the non-physical um, components of pain like stress and anxiety, but also while treating the nausea and vomiting. So it's another one to keep in mind. It's a very good medication in the setting. If those are unsuccessful, we can turn again to ketamine um, or lidocaine, which we talked about in detail earlier. Same dosing, same protocols on those. And if it's a non-nociceptive pain, if you think that there is some 
you know, psychological component, which is absolutely psychosomatic symptoms are real. People feel terrible pain from their stress, their depression. Maybe they had a reason for their pain getting worse. Oh, a couple of days ago, you know, I lost my job or this person died or I got in a fight with someone. So my pain has been worse ever since then. And you're hearing that you can consider trying haloperidol or Haldol. Uh, 2.5 milligrams IM or IV. Beware that most places, if you're going to use the IV, make you have somebody on a cardiac monitor or get a screening EKG first, which can hold up care. But usually the IM dosing, uh, people are okay doing. 2.5 to 5 milligrams um, IM. If you use the 2.5 and it's less sedating, so that's also very helpful. That can be really effective. Particularly if we're talking about hyperemesis, um, excuse me, the, the cannabinoid hyperemesis type syndrome. So somebody has a chronic marijuana smoker, um, using the haloperidol is actually the first line treatment. So you should be going to that one straight away. Questions on anything popping up? I keep trying to glance. I know Elizabeth, you'll tell me, but don't be afraid to put a question in the chat. Yeah, I don't see anything. I think you can keep going. Oh, um, great. Thanks to everyone who's submitting questions as we go. All right, next protocol, and this one I think is uh, familiar to all of us, migraine. You have a person coming in with their pretty typical migraine. Again, no red flags, there's not a fever, you don't think it's meningitis, et cetera. They're like, this is like my typical migraine, it's been four days, you know, I tried this and that and this and that at home, and I'm just not getting any better. So, first of all, I want to mention very clearly that opioids are actually not indicated in headaches. Um, in migraines specifically, they have been shown in studies to increase disability and miss days from work. They increase rates of depression and anxiety um, for people who, who have migraines. And they actually cause really bad migra or rebound migraines that, and they have, they're associated with an increased risk of bounce backs. So patients who get opioids, miss more days of work, tend to not get well as fast and tend to bounce back to the ER um, more often if you're given an opioid for the, for the migraine. So we just, don't want to do that. And I would equip you with that knowledge because sometimes I tell my patients openly, hey, you know, they say morphine only works for me. Actually, uh, did you know that while it makes you feel good right now, it's not going to help you in the long run. So I'm not really willing to do that today. So I use that data openly with my patients. And so instead, we're going to start uh, with what we like to call the headache cocktail. I think most of our providers are familiar with that phrase. Um, as you can see, there are lots of options for what can go into that cocktail, but typically you're talking about Tylenol and an NSAID. I hope you're seeing a, a theme here with that one. Same dosing that we talked about before. Um, an anti-emetic, so a, a nausea vomiting medicine like a, a Reglan or a Compazine. Again, I like the Compazine just for that anti-anxiety sort of component. Um, an antihistamine, which is a smooth muscle relaxer. It'll help kind of relax those, those throbbing, pulsating vessels in our brain. And so diphenhydramine or Benadryl. Um, promethazine, which is Phenergan, are the two most common. I know that uh, Phenergan is getting a, a bad rap and kind of being taken out of a lot of our, our hospitals for different reasons, especially in the IV formulation, but it, it works well. Um, but Benadryl is usually the one that everybody turns to. And then IV fluid bolus. So don't underestimate that even a little bit of dehydration can cause someone to have a migraine. And you bet that while they're laid up in bed with a migraine for three days, they're not drinking enough water. And so the, the fluids alone are actually a very important part, the rehydration. You can do all of this orally if somebody's migraine is not terrible. Give them the meds and you know, maybe use like the sublingual Zofran. And then once that all kind of kicks in, ask them to PO hydrate. That is possible. But for your severe mi status migranosis, like eyes closed, can't stand vomiting person, um, I, I recommend doing this all intravenously. So some adjuncts, if, uh, if your headache cocktail doesn't work or you've got some specific features, um, you can actually do a trigger point injection. So let's say that it comes with a really stiff or like firm neck or they've got some muscle knots in the back of their upper trapezius area that's bothering them. You can do a trigger point. That can help a ton. And then we also, if they've got a, a lateralizing, like a frontal, um, more lateral throbbing pain, consider a sphenopalatine ganglion block. The sphenopalatine ganglion is a collection of nerves that live right in the back of our nose. They are, uh, for those of you who care, it's a parasympathetically and autonomically innervated, innervated ganglion. And so the theory is that it's possible migraines might be a result of some autonomic dysregulation. And that if we can use lidocaine to anesthetize the nerve bundle associated with that area, we could wind down that headache cycle and kick the migraine uh, in a pretty easy way. So you can use a long Q-tip soaked, soaked in lidocaine to do this. I don't recommend it. I think that's torture. Um, if you've watched anybody get a COVID swab, it's pretty miserable. 
So instead, what you can do is you take about a half a cc of 4% lidocaine, so pretty concentrated, or 2% would work too, but 4% is ideal. Um, and you split the dose again with the atomizer, the triangular atomizer, and you just spray it uh, in the one side of the, of the nose. Um, you go on the side where the headache is. Your main target is that, that laterality. If it's right throbbing frontal, then you're going to hit the right nair. If it's the left side, then you hit the left nair. Um, the only contraindication would be an allergy to lidocaine. And the only side effects people have ever seen uh, really is that sometimes their noses bleed. Uh, so just don't be surprised if their nose bleeds. And if you follow Academic Life and Emergency Medicine or Alium, there's a great video on their website of exactly how to do this uh, block. Elizabeth, feel free to interrupt me. I see some things popping up, but I just don't know what to say. Um, after the headache cocktail, again, we mentioned uh, with the back pain that sometimes a single dexamethasone dose can help as a pain medication, not a steroid. You can also try magnesium, one gram over an hour, which is a smooth muscle relaxer. That's another option. Um, yes, Elizabeth. Yeah, um, Tommy is asking about CBD oils. And we also have uh, some groups already asking you to come and present this to other groups, but we'll, <laughs> we'll take those offline. So, sure, sure, sure. yeah. Um, Sky, do you want to comment on the CBD thing? I just don't, uh, hold on. Okay. I talk about it in a way of kind of like how I talk about multivitamins. If you have the money and you want to try it and you want to use it, sure but there just isn't any evidence on this um and i know some people swear by them and i just talk about like i'd rather have people rubbing it on their legs and smoking it to protect their lungs and so i could talk about it more in like a risk reduction type of way and i just really tell them there's no evidence that i know of if it's working for you and you have the financial support to do it sure stop for any side effects etc but if not i wouldn't waste my money on it that was better than I could have said. I'm glad I tripped that. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the bottom line is there's no evidence for any of that stuff yet. Who knows what we'll find in the future, but there's no good studies supporting it. It's decently harmless as long as the person's not getting side effects. So if it works for them, it works for them. All right, a couple of less. Uh, so let's say that you do your headache cocktail. Maybe you added those and then you didn't work all the way. So you added magnesium, maybe another bolus, and maybe you tried dexamethasone. The person's still having uh, a lot of pain. And when we say a lot of pain, we mean more than 50% of what they started with. So if their pain like went from a 10 to a two, that's pretty successful. But if their pain went, you know, it was a 10, now it's kind of an eight, I can open my eyes, but I'm still in a ton of pain. That's not quite good enough for us. Uh, your options might include Haldol, which we talked about, the IV or the IM. Um, if you're thinking about non-nociceptive nociceptive pain, so stress, anxiety, those kinds of things. And then also, valproic acid or Depakote is used a lot in the neurology community to prevent migraines. And so what we found is that there's some evidence to show that a single 500 milligram dose of valproic acid put in 50 milliliter piggyback over about 20 minutes can be really helpful. I wouldn't go using it all the time because usually you just don't need it, but that is another tool to stick in your arsenal that can be really helpful. Um, and then you can see on here that like, if it gets really bad, you can just knock people out for a minute. Like pro give them propofol once when they wake up, see if they're feeling any better. Um, but you know, I've, I personally don't ever do that. And if you are, if you've done all of this and it's still not working and now you're going to be like, well, opioids are kind of my, or propofol are my only uh, remaining options. That person needs to get admitted for a neurology consult because that's really severe, right? Like we've definitely tapped out all of our options in the ER. Um, and if you've done all of this and it's still not down by, by 50%, um, that, that's somebody who should be getting admitted to the hospital. And then if you needed to add opioids and stuff, that's fine, but they probably need imaging and a neuro workup and those kinds of things. All right, the next quote, pro, those are the main five protocols. This next one's not so much a protocol as a comment about uh, considering other alternatives. So when we do a lot of our procedures in the ER, they're painful. We do a lot of things that are very painful. This includes big abs, draining big abscesses are extremely painful for patients. It looks um, horrible. And the lidocaine numbing their skin doesn't do anything. Like we all know that's, that that's true. Um, it hardly helps at all. And then a fracture or joint uh, dislocations and, and hernia reductions, uh, foreign body removals, really long and big lacerations and with some deep tissue involved. Um, 
these things are very painful. And oftentimes we find ourselves giving opioids as an adjunct to the local anesthesia that we're using. And so I just want to bring up a couple of other options that you do have. Um, and the two main concepts are going to be using nitrous oxide and then using an ultrasound guided regional block for the area. So nitrous oxide used to be uh, in the ERs everywhere and it got taken away because staff abused it <laughs> because everyone was just like using it out of the wall. Uh, it's starting to come back though. It's a little bit more in vogue, more limited access, but it's coming in these like locked carts that has to come up from the pharmacy or whatever to be used. So there are some more uh, controls in place. But nitrous oxide is a mix of 70-30 or more typically 50-50 nitrous and oxygen mixed together. And basically it's still used uh, in endoscopy in some places, some ERs, and actually in some places during labor and delivery, uh, labor and delivery units you can use nitrous. The benefits are you do not need an IV. Uh, you might want a pulse ox if you really want one, but I'll tell you that they use nitrous in dental clinics and nobody's on a pulse ox. It's like very safe. Um, and one of the reasons it's safe is that the patient actually can hold it. And so as soon as it gets high enough, the patient kind of falls asleep, the mask comes down and then they wake back up again. It goes out of your system within 60 seconds. It's an air-based medication. Um, and so the person can drive home with no restrictions and with no prolonged observation period in the hospital or the ER, which is great. Again, it does, oh, and there's no NPO status needed. Like you don't have to have not eaten or drank anything for six hours, so that's very helpful. Again, there's a, uh, some downsides like the abuse potential. Some patients who have claustrophobia don't want to hold a mask on their face. Um, and it's definitely better to not be using inhaled medications for patients with chronic lung problems, really severe asthma or COPD. It's also not recommended for um, ear infections or people who have sinus issues or bowel obstructions because it can lead to more trapped gas in those smaller areas, which would be a bad thing. And then it's not recommended for first and second trimester pregnancy, although again, it's safe during labor. Um, there's a slightly increased risk of miscarriage and infertility. Uh, so that's, that's a possibility. And then we generally just don't use it for altered or psychiatric patients. Um, we don't wanna make them more altered. But the take home here is that nitrous is simple, fast acting, really safe in most patients. Um, and again, it, like as a, it also bodes well because it's a very efficient and fast use. There's no observation periods or monitoring, et cetera. But your hospital would have to have it on formulary. The other thing is we could give an, a two hour, three hour lecture alone on how to do ultrasound guided blocks. But what I'm gonna do instead is throw it out there as a concept that if you are still using opioids for wrist fractures and reductions or ankle fractures and reductions or even hip fracture stuff in your hospital setting, it is worth getting trained in using ultrasound guided lidocaine blocks. It provides prolonged pain relief for the patient. It's much, much safer than using stronger opioids or even sedation like propofol, et cetera. Um, and so hematoma block and regional blocks are something that we would wanna make sure our teams knew how to do uh, to facilitate better, faster and better um, uh, care with these types of procedures. Uh, and then also you can the whole nursing team put with you with a one-to-one -to, -one to monitor for sedation and yada yada. So it's much easier and it's better for the patient. And then the pain control lasts for hours, even when they leave, which is helpful. So to recap, these were the main protocols for renal colic, musculoskeletal opioid naive back pain, and then chronic or opioid tolerant back pain, chronic pain flares like abdominal pain, headaches like migraine or tension headaches, and then thinking about adding alternatives to your um, procedural pain control in the emergency department. It is important that if you're going to use any of these meds, you do need to just know their correct doses and their side effects and who should and shouldn't get them. I'm not going to go over all of that right now, but thinking specifically about like pediatrics, pregnancy, you know, cardiac patients, diabetics, it's just important to know who should and shouldn't get these medicines. And then just a quick plug also that there are other ways to treat pain that are absolutely effective, things like music or um, aromatherapy, a laughter, a distraction, like keeping your patient entertained while you're taking care of their lack repair or whatever, hot, cold, elevating extremities, and then even some meditative stuff, like there's um, this is a really good example of a finger labyrinth that for some people, tracing that, that finger garden um, can provide them a lot more calm. And so don't forget about your non-medication related adjuncts too. And there's a link on this slide that has a lot more um, great information about it that you could look at if you're interested. And now I'm going to pass things off a little bit to uh, Sky, and she's going to talk about more uh, pain management for patients like ours who are on methadone or buprenorphine. 
Hi, Alicia. This is fantastic. What a great lead in. Um, before we start the case, I did want to address the question earlier about methadone. Um, Sometimes, I for opioid use disorder, we have three um, medication options. We have methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. Um, my first line are methadone or buprenorphine, and it's really easy in terms of which one that I pick for patients because I just ask them because they always have a preference and they most of the time, 99% of the time, people have already tried either methadone or buprenorphine and they know what works. I'm family medicine trained, so I think about it in terms of like, um, when we offer birth control, the best birth control is the one that the patient's gonna take. And so it's the same thing with methadone and buprenorphine. Which one do you like? Which one works for you? Sometimes the methadone is nice because people need that structure and they need the wraparound services, especially if their lives are already very chaotic. Um, sometimes it's also nice to for, um, because some people, when you start them on buprenorphine, there's a lot of clarity that happens and a lot of people have had trauma and it can be very difficult to address all of that trauma now that, um, buprenorphine has so much more of that clarity. And so sometimes methadone is nice to help blunt some of those, um, not to like take away all those feelings, but to help blunt some of it, to really help make it a little bit more manageable for people. So I really, I, I to offer both and I use both. Um, for patients who are doing well on methadone, I do not switch them off to buprenorphine. I only switch people off if this is a request from them or if they've had adverse um, reactions or there's like contraindications for them to taking methadone. Um, this is a case, uh, this is actually a clinic patient of mine. Um, I had this lady who was seeing me for buprenorphine refills and her source of her pain was her knee osteoarthritis. And I said, hey, do you uh, want to get surgery for your other knee? And she said, no, 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 I can't have surgery because they're going to take me off of my buprenorphine they, and last time it was terrible. So I don't want to go through that. She is the only person I know that has had a bad knee replacement. Most people I know love their orthopedic surgeons. They are so happy. They're like demonstrating their knee and their hip replacement. And so I just want to sh say that this is like very significant. Um, deciding to take someone off of their uh, maintenance medication is no small thing. So, um, yeah, you can go to the next slide. <laughs> yeah, so this is our acute pain management algorithm. We have two. One is a little bit more geared towards the emergency department and critical care. This is more for the med surge units. Um, I love Alicia's uh, um, discussion about ketamine and IV lidocaine, and if we could use that on the floor, I would 100% do it, but no hospital will let me do that. Um, so this is a, structured a little bit differently. But if you go to the next one, I always continue their maintenance buprenorphine. I do not take it away. The risk of relapse, the withdrawal, the having to titrate back up is really, really challenging for people. Um, so I just continue it. Um, if they're on daily dosing, I will split it to help with the analgesic effects of it. And Elizabeth, you can jump in. Hey, Tommy is asking, um, does bup take away 100% of the pain here? So um, it depends, right? Um, I think the discussion with pain isn't really about taking away or eliminating the pain. It's about how do you make pain manageable and how do you still function? So it's not like um, you're not going to be able to feel anything. It's more about how do you get the things that you want to get done, done, and how do you not suffer from this, right? Um, that comes to our next part about like promoting calm and comfort. So with my clinic patient, I said, okay, that shouldn't be happening. People shouldn't be taking away your buprenorphine. Some hospitals still do. And I strongly encourage uh, my patients if that ever happens to, if it's something scheduled, I tell them to um, give me the contact info of the surgeons so that I can talk this through with them. Um, some hospitals have a protocol where they decrease the dose of the maintenance buprenorphine or the maintenance methadone to open up the receptors, which can happen theoretically. But really, this is a dynamic process. The bup is on the receptors, but it's pretty dynamic. And there have been several randomized controlled trials on joint replacements and on C-sections that have shown that the 
pain control with people on maintenance bupamethadone are similar to the pain control with people who haven't been on it with full agonists. You might need a little bit higher doses of the full agonist, and the thought is because that's due to tolerance, but they did not see an increase in morbidities such as respiratory depression and no increase in mortality. So this is why I still continue their maintenance dose. A couple questions about this coming in through the Q&A sky. Tommy mm -hmm. asks, can you take more and does it help to take more bup? And um, Phil Ross is asking, are there long-term effects of buprenorphine? Oh yeah, these are great. Okay, we're gonna get to that, Tommy, and we'll talk about the effects for it as well. Um, but like Alicia was talking about, really like a lot of this is um, controlling the anxiety and letting them know that you're gonna address pain. Because a lot of our patients have been through the healthcare system and have had some pretty traumatic experiences with it where nobody actually takes their pain seriously. And so they're oftentimes undertreated, especially due to their pain tolerance. And so there's a lot of distrust and one of the biggest things that I do is I keep telling them, and I say it out loud, we will treat your pain. You tell me if it's not working, we are gonna address this. Okay. We can do the next slide. Oh, wait, oh, go back one more up. I also do the same thing with around the clock acetaminophen and NSAIDs if they're not um, contraindicated. And you're right, everyone says, are you kidding? That doesn't work. <laughs> and I tell them, this is not the only thing that we're doing. We're using all the tools in our toolkit. We're, this is not the only thing. I'm not giving you only acetaminophen because that is their biggest concern. Like, are you joking? I have so much pain. Are you joking? So what I tell them is I'm using this um, high dose acetaminophen and NSAIDs. I also agree. I don't really go over 400 milligrams anymore. Maybe I'll go to six, but like rarely. And the idea of alternating them and having them around the clock is to decrease your pain at a baseline, right? It's to provide baseline analgesia so you don't have these ups and downs. And studies have shown that you decrease your overall opioid use. So this is just to control it a little bit at a baseline, and then we'll add other stuff on top of it. So with the next slide, I use a lot of non-opioid analgesics as much as possible. <coughs> Um, if someone's inpatient, I'll ask our anesthesia colleagues to help me do a regional block if that's appropriate. Um, the ketamine, mag, and um, lidocaine, I use a little bit less because we don't, can't hospital policy. But I do use a lot of gabapentinoids, and if I think someone has underlying anxiety, depression, I'll talk to them about SNRIs and TCAs, and I'll actually start them inpatient because that will help with a little bit more buy-in and a little bit med tolerability and because these take a while to kick in, um, I start it now and they can follow up and see their PCP in a week after they're discharged and see how they're doing. Um, so I, you, I throw everything on. And if they're still having pain, um, like what Tommy was saying, if they're only on 16 milligrams and I've split their dosing, I will go up to higher. I'll go up to a total of 24, 32 milligrams because there is a ceiling on respiratory depression, but not on pain. And so I'll increase the dosing. Um, some people, this goes to Philip's question, some people do feel a little bit more jittery on the higher doses, like past 32 or even at 32. Um, so I will slow down if people are telling me that they're not really tolerating it very well. Um, some people can have a little bit of sedation for it as well. In terms of long-term side effects, it's mostly the side effects people have with buprenorphine are a little bit of a headache, nausea. Um, the nausea sometimes might be um, they're actually accidentally swallowing some of the naloxone portion if they're on the combo pill, and that can help um, cause a little bit of nausea, but really most of the time people do generally pretty well off of it. It has a very long half-life. Um, but just like any other opioid, it can cause constipation and it can cause a little bit of withdrawal symptoms too if you're not tapered down off of it if you are in a high dose. Um, let me know if any of those didn't answer your questions. Um, and then the last thing I do is I think about, okay, if you're in super severe pain, like you're in pancreatitis or you have an acute abdomen, yes, I will use full agonist opioids right off the bat. But I will also think about the other things as well. Um, if they are in labor or if um, they are post-surgery, uh, then you can think about adding on full opioid agonists as well. Um, you can use whatever you want. I tend to use oxycodone because they are on the around the clock acetaminophen, um, but you can use fentanyl if you want. You can use dilated. Um, 
you can use Norco's, depends on what you wanna do. And if you're adding on a full agonist to someone who already is on buprenorphine, you will not precipitate withdrawal. So next slide. So the big take home points are, um, you can keep scrolling through them to like click it through. To basically just continue their bup, use this multi-moser analgesia, use all the tools in your toolbox, okay to use full opioid agonists. And here's a question I get a lot and I say, that people ask me a lot like, but they have an OUD, if I give them opioids, am I just gonna trigger a relapse for them? And this is a myth that a lot of our um, providers have and it's was, I think it was taught to me when I was in medical school as well. But what we now know is that the bigger, biggest trigger for relapse is pain, is under treatment of pain. It's not giving them opioids, it's not treating their acute pain. Um, and it's also important to remember they have a higher tolerance, might need higher doses, and not to be afraid to treat the pain. Yes, Elizabeth. Hey, Sky. one more question on this topic. What about if they are having problems urinating, sex drive, and would any of this make a patient sterile? Um, well, so things like SNRIs, SSRIs, TCA sometimes might have an effect on their sexual dysfunction, so I do talk about that. Um, I also think a little bit more, because I also do primary care, so I really think about you know, is your diabetes controlled? Um, is there, do you have a vascular issues? Is there something else that's causing this? Is it also like anxiety, depression? Um, so it's a little bit harder to tease out. Alicia, do you have any other thoughts on this? No, I'm with you. <laughs> the next one, I spend like a hot second on pregnancy because even if you're not a prenatal um, provider, um, Oftentimes, if you're internal medicine, you'll be consulted on someone who's admitted who's pregnant with pilo or something else is going on, and you see this um, in the emergency department, and there's a lot of fear around pregnancy. But you do something, you, it's basically all the same. Um, you continue their maintenance medication, do not take it off. You use your multimodal analgesia, you can do um, epidurals, you can use a nitrous, you can do a spinal, um, you can add on NSAIDs postpartum, Buprenorphine and methadone are safe in breastfeeding, they're safe in pregnancy. The um, Stadol and the Nubane, I think they're older medications. I don't see them being commonly used anymore, but I don't recommend using them if someone's on buprenorphine because it can precipitate withdrawal. And same thing with methadone. Um, I think that's my basic thing, is just to not be afraid to treat the pain and use all the tools in your toolbox. Awesome. Thank you, Sky. All right. A couple more things to go through. We mentioned this a few times, but I just want to, again, emphasize the importance of education. So if you think about other things we start patients on, uh, they have diabetes now, so they're going to be on insulin, or they have new AFib, they're going to go home on Coumadin, Warfarin. We spend some time talking to patients about that because these are medicines that, if used incorrectly, can be really dangerous or cause harm, but when used appropriately, really help treat somebody's acute disease process. And I think with pain, we need to own that. We don't spend enough time counseling people about how to take care of pain. We need to be okay sitting and spending a few minutes going over what it looks like when they get home, the difference between baseline pain and breakthrough pain, breaking crisis versus um, you know, having, having a more chronic problem. And so I am recommending here on the next slide that we practice saying specific phrases and being very comfortable setting expectations. Um, saying things like, you know, the body takes time to heal. It's okay to have some pain. Our goal is to move from intolerable to tolerable. And so here are a couple of good examples. We are not going to get your pain to zero today as much as I would like to, but our goal is to move from intolerable pain to tolerable pain. And so I wanna make sure that upfront you know what, what we're gonna to do today. Your body needs time to heal. You might have some pain for a few weeks, a few months, and that's okay. I don't want you to be in pain, but pain is how your body communicates with you that something is wrong. And I want you to be aware of that, but still be able to live your life. Uh, it's my job to keep you safe. While you might think that morphine or fentanyl or Norco would make you feel better right now, it's not a safe and effective way to control your pain long-term, and I'm not willing to do something that's not safe for you. 
So these are the kinds of phrases I would recommend practicing so that you're very comfortable saying it, focusing on patient safety, that you are aligned with them, but that you're not going to be slamming them with Dilaudid until their pain is totally gone because it's just not a realistic expectation. Um, even if somebody has an acute problem, like say a broken bone, right? You broke your femur. You're not going to be pain free. That's a really painful process, but I absolutely am going to treat your pain to get it to a point where you can at least rest comfortably in bed and, and watch TV or whatever. And speaking of that discharge plan, which should involve that kind of education, describing how to take time and ibuprofen, when to take your breakthrough meds, et cetera, um, as part of that education with our patients, we do need to be very cognizant of what we are sending them home with and what is safe or what is not. Um, and sometimes going home with opioids is appropriate. So the California um, American College of Emergency Physicians, the California chapter, Cal ASEP, and a lot of other organizations have put out there some basic guidelines for prescribing opioids from the emergency department. So there are sometimes uh, cases where you are going to want to send somebody home with something like Norco. And so these are their recommendations. The, the punchlines are that you want all of somebody's prescriptions normally to be coming from the same provider, right? We don't want the patient to come to 15 ERs and get different Norcos. That's not actually Oh, wait, uh, you're muted for a second. Yeah, someone just muted me. I'm not sure what happened. It's okay. Anyways, um, we also don't replace lost or stolen prescriptions for uh, acute pain opioids. And I want to be clear, like, I would not extend this for, like, people who are on buprenorphine. Um, if, if their prescription got stolen for their MAT, I would re-prescribe re it. But for the acute pain treatments with uh, Norco, Percocet, Oxy, I, we shouldn't be replacing those. Um, and then we also aren't using long acting uh, control release opioids like fentanyl patches. Um, you shouldn't be starting somebody usually newly on methadone from the ER. That's not really, we're not as good about it. Um, low threshold plus follow the state guidelines for checking that Cures database, which is really important. Um, and then if you're giving somebody uh, an amount of pills as an acute on chronic thing, aiming for about three days supply only, and then doing a really good job with your education for the alternatives. Questions on that? Yeah, Sky said this is beautiful. Yes, talk to them about how thinking about their health, not just today or tomorrow, but also 15 to 30 years from now, right? And so us slamming people with opioids right now is not looking at their longevity or their success in the long term. And so as a uh, final thing, next steps for you. And my, my hope for everybody on this call is that at your site, Establish a nurse and a, and a provider dyad that could be the champions for this. Have them go through this education, maybe come up with like a one pager you share with your staff, share our webinar to everybody to get them educated, um, work with your pharmacy to make sure that the right meds are in formulary, that you have things like ketamine, that the nurses have a protocol for being able to give it, especially in the ER, or using lidocaine for pain. Work with IT if you have to come up with user-friendly order sets, which can take some time, but really will lower the threshold of people using these medicines if they're easy to, to access. Um, and then working with your hospital system or your site to have prescription guidelines and again, ALTO protocols. There are a bajillion resources online about this stuff. Uh, and obviously I have papers and references if you need those too. And with that, unless there are other questions, that's all we have. All right, everyone, we've got about 10 formal minutes left in this session. So now's your time. If you have questions for Alicia and Sky, yeah, I agree. It's amazing and informative. Thank you for that feedback. Um, any other questions? What's coming up on this topic? What, um, I know we have a number of sons on the line. I'm curious if any of the sons have been, you know, asked questions by providers that they weren't sure how to answer about this topic that they want to share. Um, and, Otherwise, we'll wait a few minutes for questions and just know that Alicia and Skye are here for you as part of California Bridge to answer these questions. And I want to explicitly say that even though the formal funding is coming to a close, California Bridge will continue as uh, essentially the primary technical assistance provider in the state of California for this type of 
work. So right now on our website, bridge to treatment.org, there is a technical assistance request form and any hospital in the state, regardless of whether you've ever had a MAP program, ever been funded by California Bridge, ever met us before, um, can go ahead and fill out that form and you should get a pretty rapid answer. So that exists um, going forward forever. So um, here's a couple questions coming in. Um, what are some best practices related to referrals to opioid, opiate treatment from ERs? And then another question, um, oh, the first question that Robert asked about the patient who had surgery and had previous OUD issues and a history of methadone. So, oh, um, Robert, there are a few different options the way that you can tackle this. Um, if the person wants to be back on methadone, then you don't have to wait for withdrawal. Um, but there are new ways of buprenorphine starts that are coming out like microdosing. So if post-surgical they need, um, well, I guess it depends on the timeline, right? If they're here with you right now and they're not on opioids and you can just start buprenorphine pre-surgery and then they can continue it. Um, if they're on short acting, you can always um, have them hold their nighttime dose of opioids and start buprenorphine in the morning um, when they're in a little bit of withdrawal and you can titrate it up that way. Um, we have a resource about how to do buprenorphine home starts on our website, bridge to treatment.org. Um, but if the person is currently in the hospital on opioids post-surgery and you wanna start, um, you can do the same thing. You can like hold the short acting overnight and start it in the morning, or you can do some other things like microdosing, where you use tiny, tiny um, doses of buprenorphine to slowly dissociate um, some, and occupy some of the mu receptors and slowly titrate tiny, tiny, tiny doses of buprenorphine and slowly decrease the full agonist. Um, and that way they don't actually have to go into withdrawal. So there, you have a lot of different options. Um, if you wanna talk really more in depth about it, you can always contact me or you can always call the um, California Substance Use Warm Line. Um, this is 24 seven. I think the numbers are backwards because of the Zoom. Yeah, and um, if you need that information, it's actually at the bottom of bridge to treatmentorg So yeah. if you just go and click on our website, all the substance use line information is on there. We love them. Mm -hmm. um, Juliet, who's our clinical champion at um, Willits Howard Memorial is asking, oh yeah, Phil says you called the substance line, a uh, use line, they're great. Yeah, we agree. Um, are there flow sheets for Al Alto on the bridge site that we can download and laminate? Sky or Alicia, I know you both have, have had your hands um, quite in our implementation materials. So what do we have for people? Yes, I have a non-bridge-ified version, but we are working on a bridge-ified version, <laughs> if that makes any sense. So, um, and there are a lot of um, like on that resources page, um, which again is in the slides, but there are a lot of copies of it out there that exist, like from the American College of Emergency Physicians and all kinds of people that you could use in the interim, but we are working on a pretty bridge version for you. Yeah, so Juliet, if that's something that you want um, right away before our formal toolkit comes out, which is gonna be in about eight weeks, um, just reach out to me directly. You you have my email and uh, I'll get and one, you in touch. One thing I'll throw out too is if you're at a Dignity Health site or a Common Spirit Health site, um, we are also in the middle of helping them do a system-wide rollout with this same education. And I do have a Dignity Health branded version of the guideline um, that I'd be happy to share with you. So if you're interested, um, email me, alicia at bridge to treatmentorg and I will connect you with the system-wide group. So it's not for every single hospital, but if you're at Dignity Health, definitely email me and plug in. Great. Other questions? Um, let's see. We've, okay, now the questions are coming. Here we go. All right. How do physicians connect patients to opioid treatment in the community and post-hospital care? And then um, Anne Gashgarian, who's our champion at Northern Inyo Hospital, is asking, do you have a good algorithm for microdose transitioning from methadone to puke? I have a few OUD patients who self-treat with illicit methadone. No methadone clinic in their community. So, we currently don't have an algorithm for microdosing because it's still relatively new. There's been a lot of case reports and case studies on this. Um, Elizabeth, if you can send me an email with Anne's email, I can mm -hmm. send her a good um, overview paper that lists all the different methods reported in the studies, and they can kind of um, 
alter it the way that you need to and or you can always call the substance use line as well or case by case. Yeah, sure. I'll do that. I'll do that. And then as far as the follow up piece, there are a lot of different ways to connect your patients to treatment in your community. Um, you know, the bridge gold standard version is to have a substance use navigator or a patient navigator or somebody who's job it is to help facilitate that connection and that your hospital would have some kind of a relationship with a local clinic um, who, you know, again, this is the ideal world, but like saves appointments for you or can guarantee that the patient can get an appointment within 72 hours, that kind of stuff. And you would have a person who follows up on all those cases. I think the real world answer is that it's, you know, we don't always have that option with funding, et cetera. So a couple of recs, one would be that you would want to make sure someone in your emergency department or your hospital um, whether it's the case managers, the social workers, the charge nurses, someone is actually doing something to help facilitate that connection. And that you at a minimum have a list of, of local um, sites available. So someone, you should do the work, Google it, look them up, call them, find out what the process is for a patient to get access. Um, so you can at least provide the patient with a clear list of what they should do next, like call this clinic. Um, and my personal recommendation is I think that that list is better if it includes one or two telemedicine versions. Um, there's a lot of them actually out there. Work at Bright Heart Health, lots of them that a patient can do from their phone. We are working on a bridge implementation guide that will have a lot more of these details in it for you that should come out in the next few months, but um, yeah. Yeah, and it sounds like Dignity is not the only system starting to put out materials about this. Um, Juliet says that Adventist Health has come out with an order set, just came out with an order set for pain management. So um, I know there's a lot of Adventist Health folks out there. And then um, Phil Ross says the same thing about Aegis. Um, so one more question is coming through from Tommy. I'm going to set up that question, and then I actually have to um, jump to my 1130 meeting, but um, I'll allow Alicia to Skype permission to be late to that meeting if, um, if there's more questions. And Caroline is watching the chat and the clock, so she's got you. So Tommy says, would it be good to start patients on BUP in the ER for pain, or would it be better to connect with the clinic doctor so we don't start them on the wrong path? So the question was, can we, sorry, I was looking for the paper. That's okay. It's, um, would it be good to start patient, the, a patient on BUP in the ER for pain, or would it be bad, better to connect them with a the clinic doctor so they don't start on the wrong path? Uh, both. I think you could do both, right? Like if they have an OUD particularly, you can do the split dosing. If they have OUD and chronic pain, if they only have, um, They've never, they're opioid naive, like they just have chronic pain. Um, I would